Would you like to support Cubs Out Loud? One way is to join us over on Patreon. For as little as a buck a month, patrons get early access to our shows, the pre and post show, and various other rewards. You can learn more at patreon.com slash Cubs Out Loud. Thanks to all of our patrons for their support in making this podcast. Sunday, May 14th, 2023. I'm Jeff. Who's your bear? That's right. I am your bear. I'm Damon. I don't brew the tea. I just serve it. And that makes me Gary. Everyone else is thinking it, and I just say it. Welcome to Cubs Out Loud, the Bear Podcast of Indeterminate Length, episode number 695. And happy Mother's Day! I still need to call my mom. You better make this quick. <laughs> took the words right out of my mouth i was like well guess it'll be a quick show uh so it's it's when there's time for there we go <laughs> I, I, we heard what you did there yes we did <laughs> Gary, what are we talking about today? Uh, well, yeah, um, it's called the blood ban again. Um, and here's why, because we did talk about being able to donate blood in a previous episode. In fact, it was COL 550. Um, and if I remember correctly, Q... I think was our guest. Now I'm going to do a quick search. Um, <laughs> Beat me right to it. Hold on. I know what episode it was. I'm just trying to remember because I'm pretty sure. Uh, and the thing is, is that one wasn't called. Yes. That that number. See, well, 550 to blood ban. Yeah. So. And he um, was a guest. So uh, we're kind of revisiting it. See, and. Yeah, anyways, that was in April of 2020. Um, so this just came across the radar uh, Thursday, May 11th. The FDA made an announcement. It hit the wire. People like were being informed of changes that the FDA made when it comes to blood donations here in the U.S. And this has been a touchy subject for the LGBTQIA community, especially um individuals that have sex with men primarily those that are uh male um identifying and some other things so i felt like we should just kind of review what happened and potentially ask the question has anything technically changed does it matter is it important is it more confusing than ever <laughs> Ooh. Well, reading that article, the PBS article, I, I already have some opinions, but mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, I figured as much. I figured that some people's going to have uh, opinions based because right. based off of what I read, mm -hmm. if anything, I could get blood. Correct. If you meet the screening requirements to be able to donate that is a possibility however there are others who cannot there are reasons behind this i understand the reasons as a person who works in hiv prevention i get why the decisions were made um i guess i'm feeling a little bitter about it because it's still not what people would like it to be but there's right. there's justifications um so there's going to be a whole series of article links that are going to be listed on the website for the blog um the first one's going to be the pbs article uh 
which is where I caught it first. And then most of the rest of these are the FDA. Um, any of you that want to be wonkish and read up on regulations and proposals and finalizations and recommendations and implementations and things about questions and uh, in the AABB um, questionnaire, which is the Association of the Advancement of Blood and Biotherapies, who kind of oversees what can be done and the questions. Quick, 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 quick pause. Mm -hmm. Did you just say wonkish? Yeah. Can you spell that for me? <laughs> W-O-N-K-I-S-H. Do, do we need a definition <laughs> breakdown? <laughs> Oxford Dictionary says it's having or characterized by enthusiastic or excessive interest in a specialized detail of a particular subject or field. Especially political policy. That was going to be the regular dictionary with Jeff, and you stole it. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> you guys. I, I just have never heard that used before because I'm like, how is this in relation to Willy Wonka? It's not. I know, <laughs> but that was my first impression. <laughs> but it's a great question. Yeah. That's, um, I, I had to pause you there I, because you, you said a word I did, wasn't familiar with. and just you know, No, no, no. It, it's totally fair to ask it. I've, I've heard it used several times. To be fair, it's always kind of in a political context, but it doesn't have to be. It's basically each of us probably has our wonky kind of things you know it's something that we take great interest in and probably have a decent amount of knowledge about i guess is the best way to phrase it right. um it could be damon and musical theater it could be jeff and uh fort no not Fortnite. fallout no, no. Oh, damn it final, final fantasy. fantasy the other f <laughs> <laughs> i was like you were getting there he you knew it began there. with an f <laughs> <laughs> what are the Streaming Game. games. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm sounding older than I am, and I'm an old man. But anyways, you, so you, there's going to be a whole series off, of like three types of games and all that. Yeah, that was the worst part. That was the weird thing. Like you're like Fallout, and then I was like, nope, and then you're like uh, the other one, and I was like, oh, that's a totally different genre. <laughs> Fallout. <laughs> I was going for the letter alliteration, not for the style. Anyways, because I could see it. I could almost see the logo. Anyways, it was bad. My apologies to everybody. But anyways, no, there's going to be a whole series of links. And you don't need to read all of these, but they will be there if you would like to. Reference material. Yes. References. Uh, yeah. So here's what it really comes down to. Um, if you are sexually active... Your behavior may prevent you from being able to donate blood. Um, and, and this is really the, the simplistic bullets. Yes. In the past three months, have you had sexual contact with a new partner and have had anal sex? If you say yes, you cannot donate. In the past three months, have you had sexual contact with more than one partner and had anal sex. You cannot donate. In the past three months, if you had sexual contact with anyone who has ever had a positive test for HIV infection, you cannot donate. Same time frame, have received money, drugs, or other payment for sex, um, which is the last part about payment for sex is a questionable item because sex work is valid. Right. Sex work is work. Right. Anyways. Right. Sorry. Um, now I know. That's why I'm like, this is such dicey stuff. Uh, have you ever used, or it's not have you ever, have you used needles to inject drug steroids or anything not prescribed by your doctor in the past three months? That was kind of a given mm -hmm. because needle sharing is one of the main mechanisms in the past. I don't know if we can say with any predominance today of transmission of HIV. 
um, because most likely the injection aspect is that the needle is not a fresh needle. That's the, the bigger concern. Right. So the sharing is, is where the issue comes in. Have had any sexual contact with anyone who has received money, drugs, or other payment for sex, or used needles to inject drug steroids or anything not prescribed by a doctor, which is kind of blending all that stuff. Um, have had syphilis or gonorrhea or been treated for syphilis or gonorrhea in the past three months. So this is all in those windows. And then there's some other stuff. So yeah. running through that quick bullet list is the is the new uh, efficient question mark like style of how the FDA is approaching things to try to clean up a lot of the things because one of the bigger issues was that the FDA was being accused of being discriminant, um, which is kind of dicey. But the but the thing was is that um, the new version of the policy eliminates any time based deferral. Um, of men who have sex with men or women who have sex with men who have sex with men. So there was the, like, that's what I mean. Like it kind of gets into the weeds a little bit. Um, yeah. It, 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 the, based off of your questions it is a little broader because it, because it says it doesn't say specifically say have sex with men, just have sex and anal sex. Right. Yeah. And part of the reason behind the anal sex being part of the questions is because the anal tissue um, is highly susceptible to where you can have your um, exposure potentially to bloodborne pathogens. Right. So that's that's really where that kind of is coming from. Now, where it gets a little bit more complicated or where people are going to have opinions and there's reasons behind this is if you are on medicine to – reduce your viral load if you are a person living with HIV or to prevent um, an infection of HIV due to exposure, you are not allowed to donate. Yeah. Now, that's where, yeah, it, that's it's where been, comes in. I know. So we'll get to that in a second. The, the thing is, is that if you are a person diagnosed with HIV, even if you are on medicine and you are, as we say in the work in care, and you take it regularly and you get all your testing and you're undetectable. The reality is, is that you still have HIV in your system. It is never eliminated. It is not cured. Right. So that's the reason donation is not possible. If you are on medicines to prevent infection, there's a key thing that a lot of people probably aren't quite aware of unless you were in the field or you pay attention to it. There is a window time in which you are undetectable but you are actually zero converting and you ha are you have hiv we just don't know that testing is not immediate so if you if i had an exposure say last night i had sex with somebody it was unprotected and i'm not on prep and like they carry hiv the issue is i won't know that no one will be able to know that for approximately three weeks or longer because testing will not indicate that I have the virus or that my body is building up uh, mm -hmm. a reaction. I'm not going to get into the wonkiness of it for the lay person, but so that window period is where things get dicey. Yeah. So, and while there is sophisticated testing that can detect things, say within four weeks, the generality for the longest time has been about three weeks. So that's where this whole like three or sorry, three months rule has been existing from. Yeah. So it's just, yeah. Anyways, I'll stop I think for now. one of my, well, I think one of my biggest issues with this so far is it, this article reads, and I'm going to just quote from it. It says, quote, those taking pills to prevent HIV through sexual contact will also be barred until three months after their last dose. Hmm. Um, the FDA noted that the that the medications known as PrEP can delay the detection of the virus and screening test. So I'm reading that part. So it says three months after the last dose, but most people take PrEP every day. So Correct. kind of So you would have to stop taking daily PrEP. And then three months later you can donate. But that kind of defeats the purpose of PrEP. 
Well, uh, it doesn't defeat the purpose of prep. It just makes you ineligible to donate. Right. Because the concept right. is you're taking it. Well, and I guess I'll put it this way. The idea behind taking prep for HIV is if you're taking it, you are a population individual that has the potential for exposure. If you're not potentially going to have exposure, then you don't need to take it. It's not like insulin for diabetes, where this is an ongoing condition that needs to be dealt with on the daily. Mm -hmm. But this is also where it gets a little dicey because the FDA doesn't really like to recognize or talk about 211, which right. is where PrEP for HIV is taken around an exposure. Um, I have to be careful how I want to say this, but basically if – an individual has an exposure or thinks they may have an exposure because you may be having anonymous behavior activities and you're not going to be able to ask individuals their status. So as a precaution, you might want to take PrEP. And so the 211 concept is you take two pills the day of and then one pill each day the next two days afterwards. So what you're basically doing is giving your immune system a boost in the ability to prevent the virus from uh, embedding right. itself and right. replicating. Yeah. That's kind of where I, I think my part I have the most issue with is that most of the people who are doing it are doing PrEP are doing it to prevent the infection. Um. And I understand, like, they're in, you know, there's a possibility, there's a potential window where it could potentially happen, but it does feel odd to me that someone who is actively engaging and preventing themselves from um, getting HIV is still barred from donating blood without taking other, you know, essentially abstaining or without abstaining, you know, stop taking their medication and stop having sex. Cause that's sort of the, the flip of it. You would have to either stop taking it and stop taking and, and not have sex um, for three months. Cause I mean, that's, that's the way it would fall. Cause if the main reason you're taking it is to prevent yourself from catching HIV, but if you're taking it to prevent yourself from catching cancer in your V while you're having sex, then if you have to stop taking it in order to donate blood, you, you're going to also have to stop having sex. Right. And it's important to make sure that people understand that the FDA absolutely wants it to be clear to people that you do not stop taking prescribed medication in order to be able to donate. Right. And that's Period. kind of this, like, this situation is falling. And, like, it's falling into this, like, well, like me. Uh, I'll just use me as a perfect example. Like, am I, have I been sexually active in the past three months? Well, NAB was in February, so, yeah. Um, well, what? Anyway, um, there hasn't been any anal sex, um, period, in months. And, but I do take PrEP every day. I do take mm -hmm. Discovery every day. So, due to that, I cannot donate right now. Right. But if I wanted to donate, essentially in three months, I have to stop taking prep, like, tomorrow, because I took it this morning, not take it for three months, not engage in any sexual activity for three months, and then I can donate. Right. So, that's kind of the... Like, that's a lot to essentially engage someone in in order to give blood. And I understand the reasonings behind it. I understand the rationale behind it all. But it does seem to be counterproductive um, if, you know, someone wants to, if you're, if the whole purpose of these rules or some of these rules is to prevent infected blood from getting into the system. Right. So, and the main concept here is that they're they're moving, they're re regaging the way people get assessed. So, this implementation um, is called an individual risk based approach. What that means is 
it's on a one-to-one -one basis as you go through the process to donate they will ask you and basically screening questions items to determine your eligibility they actually do this with everybody but the previous guidance was written in a way and it came across as if you're msm men who have sex with men you're not allowed to donate yeah and it was that way forever and the longest time and then it changed i think it was in 2020 when they were like hey you can actually donate however you have to have like been a monogamous relationship and these other things like there was all these stipulations and everybody um not everybody but a large amount of people just basically flipped a bird at the fda and was like this is yeah. bullshit and they didn't really see it changing a whole lot and then i think it was last year they changed it to if you had been nine months and I apologize, I don't have Six this like correct, but yeah, there was a window time period and things. So they're they've been slowly making progress. Question mark. Yeah. I get it. I understand why they're doing it. Like now they're seeming to be more in line with Canada in the UK. That was part of why they did this. Um, they actually posted back in January the proposal um originally for this. Um, to say that. This is what we're looking to do. Then there was a 60 day window for people to express their opinions, so on and so forth. Um, so the only thing that I have to read up on, go ahead, Jeff. There was a, it was 2015 when they dropped the lifetime ban for men who have sex with men, MSMs and replace it with the one year absence requirement. And then in 2020, they shortened the absence period And so they've been like they've been slowly decreasing the amount of time. And I knew we were going to get into this difficult position of you have to give the body's immune system enough time to be tested, basically, via like when you get you have a blood donation, um, those kind of things. Now, I didn't get to see this in the information, something that was listed in the proposal, but I haven't seen it in the current day stuff that I find a little tricky is about injectable prep so for those that aren't aware there is a medicine out there called apertude that was uh, approved i think december last year january this year somewhere in that window that individuals could take a uh once every other month injectable so instead of taking a pill 365 days a year you can have an injection uh, basically every 60 days uh and just so folks are aware, a lot of the prep for HIV medication is based off of the medicine we've used for treatment of persons living with HIV. So the concept was, oh, look at the success that we're having. Persons with HIV have very low or undetectable viral loads. Could this medicine be used as a preventative instead of just a treatment? And so studies have been done, and that's how we've gotten to where we are today. That being said, the injectable... Um, has a longer lifespan within mm -hmm. the body. So when you take a medicine, it has a it has a lifespan, basically. It's kind of like, but not the same, as when we talk about um, atomic, like molecular items breaking down over time. The same concept happens when you take medicine, especially if you take medicine with regularity. So like if you take a blood pressure medicine or something to for your cholesterol, you take a possibly metformin or whatever for, you know, your blood sugar, any of those things. If you take it with regular regularity and frequency, you build up within the body and the body tissues that medicine. So it's lifespan will be longer than when you stop and it's not true of all medicine but some medicines quickly are filtered out of the body so like the kidneys the liver they like eradicate it rather quickly but there's a fair number of medicines that end up lasting weeks or months mm -hmm. and injectable prep for hiv is kind of one of those I'd have to read a little bit further, but one of the stipulations in the proposal in January was that those taking injectable PrEP to prevent HIV would be deferred for two years from their most recent injection. Wow. Yeah. 
And that's wow. because of studies have shown that injectable prep lasts longer in the body than the one's daily tablets. Wow. Now I'm not, don't misunderstand that it lasts for two years. It's just the FDA was looking at a proposal of making it that long of a window. Mm. And so that's why the individual based approach is the preferred direction the FDA is going. Cause they're basically going to say, Hey Gary, like please answer these questions or review this information. And then based on how you answer determines your eligibility. Right. So between the three of us, kind of like what Jeff was saying, if you're have not had a, a behavior or a risk exposure activity in the past three months, then you could donate. If you have been taking prep and have stopped, say, 60 days ago, you have to wait an additional small amount of time before you can donate, provided in that small amount of time you don't have any behaviors. <laughs> like, right. So it's really incumbent not on the person donating but on the staff to navigate these things and help explain right. that. Or as in Damon, like you were saying, um, you're kind of on the cusp probably of the end of a 90 day window from an activity, but taking the medication mm -hmm. is the key factor, not right. the behavior. Right. Yeah. It's, it's interesting to me that that's one of the limitations, but again, I understand why it's there. I'm not particularly happy about it, but yeah. it makes sense. Um, Cause you're right. Um, unless you are testing regularly, regularly, whew, never say that word. Um, then you're not going to know cause you usually get tested every three to six months when you're on prep. That's kind of the, the time frame, you know, depending on how often you're engaging in sex. Um, it can be anywhere from three to six months if you go and get tested to clear yourself, essentially, to maintain or continue taking PrEP. So between tests, you know, depending on how sexually active you are, there is a possibility. And unless, say, you get tested in the day after, the day, you know, um, day or two after, like you go and engage in high-risk sex activity and then you come back and you, you are um, tested, then there's a possibility that you're going to fall out of a window, if you know what I mean. Like those time frames where you have the potential to be infected or have been infected, but it won't show until two or three tests down the line, potentially. Yeah. So I do have to say that the FDA it has a really tough job in, this, in, yeah. in regards to this because. What they're trying to do is open up how many people can, can donate blood. And since 2015, they've been gradually getting it to a wider, more, a, a much wider spectrum of people being able to do that. So they can get, uh, there was a comment in that PBS article about Donate missions plummeted during the pandemic. Right. Totally understandable. Um, and so what they've done here was they're trying to navigate, trying to open up even further, but still being safe. Right. Right. So, a lot of people might still be negative on what they're doing. Yeah. And it's understandable. Maybe it's something where, where it's like, well, this is obviously going to just knock me out of the running still of, of, mm -hmm. of being out it, despite all of my precautions about being right safe. And, and, you know, my blood is perfectly fine because of this, that, and the other. But they're not going to allow it because of this, 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 and this. This, it's kind of one of those, uh, the few apples spo spoil the bunch or whatever that saying, however that saying goes. 
And, and one of the key things that you're talking about, Jeff, is that so it explains in the education materials, which we'll have a link to FDA approved antiretroviral drugs are safe and effective in preventing the sexual transmission of HIV. However, these antiretroviral drugs, um, ARTs, uh, do not fully eliminate the virus from the body. And donated blood can potentially still transmit HIV infection to a transfusion recipient. So that that's where this really kind of gets into the nitty gritty. And mm-hmm. um, it, it, like it, to give you an example to help people maybe understand is, uh, let's say, um, please forgive, Damon was a hoe at you know NAB and had a lot of fun. <laughs> and <laughs> um, stop. Turned around and um, was on prep and was with somebody who is a person living with HIV who has been okay, but not exactly the most on their regimen. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so they have more than X amount of viral uh, component in their system that can show up on a test. So in theory, people would say, oh, well, Damon's on PrEP for HIV, so they won't serial convert on HIV. Well, PrEP is not 100%. That part. Right. So you have to keep that in mind. And then on top of it, um, let's say Damon stopped taking PrEP, like, a couple days after the Bacchanal has ended because they're like, I got a wedding coming up. I got <laughs> things to do. I ain't got to have no time for no man and no, none of that business. So I'm going to be celibate. Just, you know, yada, yada. So even if that was all the circumstance, the thing is, is that that that's the reason for the window, because we still need to allow enough time for the body to process the the medication that was preventing the zero conversion to like kind of live out its lifespan while at the same time allowing the body to do what the body does. Yeah. And then at the end of the time, Damon goes in to donate blood. They're still going to test the blood. Mm-hmm. So if, if all of that has been an ideal scenario, let's say they're still going to test the blood that gets donated for hepatitis B, C, HIV, syphilis, and some other infections. And it's possible because it was a recent infection, potentially, that it may not show. Well, right? that's why that's why they're giving you that time frame window. Uh-huh. Like, so they would they would have to ask some specifics and look at it and be like, okay, so when was the last time you did things? What's today's date? Let's work it backwards because that's kind of what we do in public health. Like sometimes when we're talking about, I mean, a lot of this happened during COVID. When were you potentially exposed? When did you first start having symptoms? Like that creates your your time frame and all that kind of jazz. So right. it's no different in this area. Like, you know, it's like, you know, what what activities were you partaking in? When did you do that? When was that? And then we can try to start doing the, the calculations basically. Right. So yeah, there there is a potential depending on what happened within a time frame, you know, and that stuff. And it's like, and and keep in mind, like another aspect that could complicate things is Damon's like, well. You know, like I was busy Thursday, Friday, Saturday, one for the road on Sunday, like and (laughs) and Sunday was the last day I took my Truvada or my generic Truvada or my Discovy as the once dailies um, tablets as the person who's screening them. I would be like, okay, so you didn't take it on the Monday after you didn't take it on the Tuesday after, which are key questions because Uh we want to have a couple of days after potential exposure of continuing to take the medication as a precaution. And if they say no, then that's not only will that end up turning into not being able to donate, but then it will turn into in the next week or whatever, you should have a testing done Mm -hmm. as a screening because while you're you were well intentioned, the reality is like it's not just a super hero like in your body yeah. like on the day of. You kind of need it for another day or so after, right? Right. right. At least two days, three days, hopefully. So, yeah. 
So there, yeah. there's a lot of things to keep in mind about it. Um, I did happen to look through them and I uh, added a new bullet point. The medication deferral list. This is very interesting if you're into this kind of stuff. It's actually a whole list of all the different medicines that can potentially pause or delay you from donating and not just in prevention of HIV. So there's things on here like um, antiplatelet agents, which is preventing a stroke or a heart attack, anticoagulants, some mm. acne treatment stuff, rheumatoid arthritis, hair loss, prostate, hepatitis, uh, cancer uh, things. Like there's a whole yeah. list of stuff um, and it basically goes from the shortest time frame at the top of the document down to the longest. Um, so you, you might find that to be interesting. Amongst the list, which is what I was looking for, injectable HIV prevention known as Apertude, uh, Cabotegravir is two years. So they did put into place what was the proposal. Yeah. And that's, again, that's a lot to think about. And yeah. I think... While it's unfortunate, you know, that, you know, some people still could not donate, it is, a, there's rationale behind it. And they are slowly opening the doors, as it were, right. you know, um, we know now it's three months. It could potentially, within the next, you know, year or two, it could potentially go down to a month. You know, who knows? It's just going to be a matter of how well regulated all of this can be and what science can do right. and dictate for it all. Um, I've, I know that the lifetime ban for a long time was a big factor for many people. And it's a sign, it's a, and a bone of contention for, for many um, LGBTQ you know, plus people. Um, and it does suck that that only just went away a handful of years ago, 2015, if Jeff. Right. Right. Correctly. Yeah. Um, and that does still suck, but it's getting better. And now we know it's now just three months, you know, a decade ago that I would have been rejected outright. Right. Exactly. Well, we all were like, that was yeah. my biggest beef when I, when I became sexually active in college, right? The moment I had sex with another male in, I'm doing the math. Hang on. <laughs> 1994. I think 30 years ago. Yeah. In the end. So the moment I put I put a peen in my mouth. I was banned for a lifetime. Right. Because at that time there was no differentiation or delineation about anal. It was just that you had sex with That's another sex male mm -hmm. because MSM has been a priority population still is to this day significantly in a, in some areas as the predominant highest percentage of new infections. So that's part of the rationalization behind these rules and regulations, how things happen is because that's where the newest infections are coming. So science, the statistical data says, this is where we're seeing this come from, blah, blah, blah. That's why we follow things a certain way. So I found out when I was in college, I think sometime after that, I was like, like there was a blood drive or whatever. And people were asking me, you know, if I was going to donate blood or something. And I think I got a hold of the paperwork before showing up is what happened. And I saw that if it, you were born, if you have, I think the way the question used to be phrased, I'd have to see if I can find an old form online, a copy of it. It said something like if you'd ever had sex with another man since 1977, you were just banned from outright giving blood. Right. And I was like, say what? Yeah. I was like, I was, I was single digits old <laughs> when the potential of something could happen. And you were just like, nope. eh, never. So I just thought of something. Uh, the sides have all the power now. They're the ones that can give blood. <laughs> well, I see where you're going with that. Um, <laughs> Cause all the questions are about anal sex, right? If you don't have anal sex, 
three months off, you can still be sexually active, just not anally. I mean, that's that is that is a significant contributing factor in the screening. Yes. Yeah. So <laughs> so there, there I guess there is a, a, a rainbow to this that if you are an individual that is only uh, oral or um, right or like you use everything, but there is no insertion. Right. Giving or receiving. Right. Then yes, like like you qualify potentially but again there's still more other things that could that have to be taken into account i'm just saying yeah it's a, it's a, it's a, it's said, a it said be completely abstinent for three months no you don't have to be just no anal stuff right just mm -hmm. one activity removed from the equation Sorry. Um, yeah, I, I I agree. Like there there is a potential to it. So I think for the, going into the future, the youth of this country will probably not have the same thoughts or opinions as those of us that are older. When the fact that we were outright banned and told we could never give blood, like that pain. Like, isn't something I think for a good number of people that easily resolves and goes away. Despite advances in the policies allowing more individuals to be able to donate, it doesn't remove what we may have interpreted or taken as stigma. So, because I think the argument for quite a number of years was you're penalizing individuals because of their orientation, which from a certain perspective, qualifying a person as a man who has sex with men is not about orientation because that's a behavioral label. Right. And the reason why it's phrased that way is because Hold on to your seatbelts, kids. There are men out there who don't call themselves gay, who don't call themselves homosexual, who don't consider themselves bisexual, but they do have sex with men. We've right. discussed it several times on this podcast. Um, we're just friends. We're just buddies. Stuff we do is nobody's business. It's on the DL. Like, right. it, it has a gazillion labels, references, cultural things. And... I'm straight. A uh, hole's a hole. <laughs> and that. So, that that's where things get complicated. And I know that in some communities, like, MSM is, is spicy. It's dicey. Like, it really like brings up feelings for people working within public health and understanding the, the, un, the nuance of it. I'm not personally a fan of it, but I understand it. And I get why right. the, the, you know, the lay person, so to speak, maybe like feeling that it, it's kind of calling things out. But at the same time, yeah. I'm like, this is about data and data isn't meant to like describe you Right. But it might apply to you. Right. This is the way to look so, at it. So, you know, like, prior, so for example, prior to 2015, if you had a dalliance with, you know, a man in college or growing up or whatever, um, prior to 2015, if it was just a one-time thing, you were technically banned because you had had sex with men. You are a man who has sex with a man. Man. Mm -hmm. Now it's different. It's right improved. now it's right now it's not a lifetime. Yeah. So this is gonna sound bad because it just popped in my head as an example. Jeff could have been very, very active in his twenties and thirties, and then chilled out over time right. and got to a point where this is all true the, the <laughs> pan, <laughs> the, i don't the i don't pandemic, have a fax line the, the pandemic came along and they were like nope 
Nothing's happening with nobody, nowhere, no how. And so under the previous policy, absolutely banned, never allowed. Uh-huh. And then the, the modifications of the policy made more opportunity to qualify. And if that um, ha- if that limited and or non activities has continued, then yes, absolutely donating becomes a potential. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. abstinence <laughs> since before the pandemic. So and, and I think that, you know, the my had hope had yeah. My hope had been that like we would see support from our community that people would be like more enthusiastic about the potential of giving blood because they couldn't before. What I did not predict back in 2020 was the you can go to hell and pound salt forever, you Satanists and your ivy tower and your white coats. Like, those weren't the words, but man, some people were just like, no. Yeah. Like, they yeah. were like, this is not good, not effective, like, does not, like, does not make up for, like, the pain of decades of blah, 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 and the delay in, of like, other countries had already advanced on this issue. And right. I think it was part of where it was like, while we are considered, and unfortunately in the world, a pillar in certain aspects of, like, medicine and um, studies and, like, screening and that kind of stuff in the FDA and, and that kind of jazz, this was an area where people really were, like, raising eyebrows and going, uh... Okay, other countries have already figured this shit out, like, and how to move ahead. What's going on with y'all? Um, <laughs> right. Thank you. Where the hell y'all been? Yeah. Yeah. We're very, very conservative in these cases. Ugh. Sorry, that word. Anyways. Um, <laughs> I know. So, yeah, yeah. like. Uh, no, I mean, even look at our healthcare system compared to lots of other uh major company uh, countries right in comparison to the globe our healthcare systems are very advanced and no. yet and yet like there are some out there that are that are whooping our ass um because they're looking at things differently and we still struggle to this day in the US with the concept of preventative versus um like reactive, like this whole concept of being proactive versus reactive is what I'm talking Universal about. Healthcare. Well, like, so it, look at it this way. If you know what your condition is currently, then you can work towards improving it and be preventative about that concept. And the, the dollars pay off in the long run, which is why, it's sort of insane, in my opinion, if an insurance company decides to drop covering PrEP for HIV, because the math says if you drop covering PrEP for HIV and then I later contract HIV, now you have to pay for the treatment of the condition, which costs way more than the medicine to prevent it. So that's been one of the the antagonizing issues in our healthcare system is that there hasn't been an agreement on that front. And so some insurance companies are good about stuff and they're like, you want to go to chiropractic care? Great. We will help cover, you know, a whole bunch of those things. You want massage therapy, you want behavioral health, you want like, you know, uh, therapy sessions with a psychologist or psychotherapist. Like, like those are preventative kind of things. Um, Just, you know, your, your annual exam. Correct. Right. Totally. And we'll cover those things because we're trying to get ahead of the conditions that come later that cost millions of dollars. And yet there, it, that's not where all, all the policies are. That's not where all the companies are. That's not where medical community is. It's kind of wild to me to try to talk to a doctor about a preventative and they're like, what? And you're like, <clears throat> like, <laughs> We're we're still in this like sad self advocacy awareness kind of like situation, right? And I don't know if we'll ever get beyond it. And part of the reason to the reality is medicine has advanced so much and is is leapfrogging in some areas. 
like right now there's a potential that a study that's underway has shown um, it's early stages. So don't everybody like, you know, uh, do a celebratory dance, but there's a potential that there's an HIV treatment medication that could help with Alzheimer's. Mm. Here's my parallel to that. Um, Viagra, like Cialis, these erectile dysfunction medicines were originally for treating blood pressure. So this is about taking current things and finding out they have other benefits. But it's about studies and tests and getting all those things figured out. So the the reality is, who knows where we'll be in another five to ten years in the medical front. The difficulty will be for those working in the industry to keep up. It's just becoming – I mean we crossed this threshold probably around the millennia change, maybe in the 90s. Not quite the 80s, I think, but maybe even in the 90s where like nurses and doctors and specialists, they just can't keep up. There's so much stuff that's going on and things that are out there that it becomes more and more challenging to be on top of the latest X, Y, Z, especially as you're aging. If you're younger, you might have more like interest, more energy to keep up on these things and to read articles and and be willing to take on new information. But I think over time, like like the brain can only hold so much kids. It's been proven like while we are faster at processing than computers can be at times. There's only so much room for the information to go and for it to be like understood and, and recalled, especially. So that's where I think the biggest challenge comes into play. And it, it takes time for us to kind of catch up with that. And, you know, the human brain can only hold so many faces, so many names, like, and all that kind of jazz. And I think that's where the issue is with our, with our medicine. They just can't mm-hmm. keep up. So keep up. potentially, and I, this is very dicey to say, because AI has been in the news a lot and people have many great opinions about this. I'm like, maybe this is where one of the benefits can be that, you know, medical staff can put in information and then some generated programming can determine based off of what has been listed like oh so because you are of this um biological gender at birth because you are of this race because you are of this age group because you like weigh this much historically over time and you're and like these other vital signs there is a potential within the next three to five years x could be your outcome factor right most likely like a disease state so this is something we could work on preventing if we do this that or the other and the reality is we're human beings and we're going to do what we want to do that's the other part of this i think it's very frustrating is like people are going to choose to do what they need to do because we still haven't gotten it together as a society to realize like there's a lot of problems and people got a lot of issues and like until we work on those things and be better just as a society because we take better care of ourselves and we develop better like mechanisms for dealing with stress and trauma and whatever you want to call it. You know? Yeah. Humans love to avoid pain. I mean, some people are kind of into it. There's no kink shaming here. That's a whole different thing. Well, that's also in a very controlled situation. Well, at least that's what we endorse. <laughs> that, is our, that is our preference around here. <laughs> None of us are wearing our consent as our profile shirt. So. I know. Not but, we, but we have other fun ones that we'll talk about shortly. Yeah, because I think that's the end. Yeah. 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 We pretty much talked everything to death. But needless to say, uh, Possibly more opportunities. Know the guidelines and answer answer honestly. Any questions? Hey, if you would like to contact us and uh, comment about anything that we discussed here, you can do that at cubsoutloud.com and leave a comment on the blog. Choose an email at cubsoutloud at gmail.com or leave us a voicemail at 361 Seal of Talk. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube at Cubs Out Loud, the appropriate place of the URL. You can also join our entourage chat at bit.ly slash telegram dash col to find out when we're planning on recording these shows and what we're planning to record the topic of the day at bit.ly 
Bit.ly slash calendar dash COL. Uh, you can also get various accoutrements, such as a flexibility for accessibility shirt, or mine uh, made to be lick, paired, shared, spooned, and loved shirt. <laughs> and other different items, such as a handy towel. At our Zazzle store at zazzle.com slash Cubs Out Loud. Uh, some of those designs were designed by Smashy, such as the Flexibility for Accessibility shirt. You can find more of his work at tpublic.com slash user slash Smashy the Bear. You can also become a patron at patreon.com slash Cubs Out Loud or send us a donation at people.me slash Cubs Out Loud. You can subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify. Please rate us, review us there. YouTube, uh, do the same. Uh, like, comment, and subscribe. Uh, you can find me anywhere in the internet. It's box, that box, poppy box, cop box, something or other. Damon? If you wish to get in touch with me, you can find me as theatercub 79 That's T-H-E-A-T-R-E-C-U-B-7-9 on most bear-related sites or on Facebook. Or you find me as pup underscore umbra on Twitter. That Twitter is definitely not safe for work. If you want the safe for work one, you can go to DMAGamer79. Gary? <laughs> if you would like to get in touch with me, um, you can find me pretty much anywhere online as Gabriel73. And with that, take it out, everybody! Good night, everybody! Have a good one, y'all!